Welcome to Sky Talkers. Here are your hosts, Charlotte and Caitlin. Hello, and welcome to Sky Talkers. I'm your host, Charlotte. Hey, everyone. I'm your other host, Caitlin, and welcome to this week's episode where we're talking all about The Bad Batch Season 3, Episodes 12, 13, and 14. We were, you know, we were looking at our schedule at the beginning of Season 3, kind of deciding how to parse out all of these episodes because we're not doing week to week. And I remember we got to the end thinking, well, we can't. It doesn't feel right to have episode 14 with the finale. It feels like the finale will stand on its own. So I don't know. It created this kind of weird group of three near the end here. (laughs) It's a weird group of three, but it's also not. We're leading up to the finale and it makes a lot of sense. And that's generally what we're going to be talking about today. So yeah. And they do feel like a arc. Uh, I know. I know. They're kind of self-contained in that way, I think, uh, as we're making, as the Bad Batch are making their way to Tantus. So this podcast will be going live with episode 14, Flash Strike, because Caitlin and I actually got screeners for these episodes. So we did get to watch them together. And honestly, I felt like they all go together. So I'm really happy that we're doing it this way and we're covering it with these these three all together. So let's start off with Juggernaut. Yeah. So Juggernaut was directed by Stuart Lee, written by Ezra Nachman. Ezra, back again. (laughs) Just back again with Ezra. I always have to shout it out when we get another Ezra. (laughs) Episode. I know. <laughs> this one, this one was uh, the thing about all three of these episodes is I feel like they were very action heavy, especially on the Bad Batch side of things, as we're really seeing them risk it all in order to find a way to Tantus. And of course, the big thing with uh, Juggernaut here is that they end up going back to find Rampart. And this is intel that Crosshair gives them. Let's talk about this beginning a little bit, though, because, you know, Juggernaut comes off the tails of what is it called? Point of No Return, where Mm -hmm. we, you know, you and I both freak the freak out with Crosshair missing the shot, letting Omega get away. Wrecker was down and out. We didn't know what was going on with Hunter. I was quite literally beside myself. And then we have this opening with the rest of the Bad Batch. And this is where Crosshair gives that intel about Rampart. And, you know, Rampart could know a way to Tantus, but Crosshair's never shared this before because he, it's, Tantus wasn't ever a place he wanted to go back. And I gotta say, I, probably my one critique for these three episodes is that, I don't know, I kind of felt like we would get more of this angsty moment of reveal. We would get to see this moment of reveal where Crosshair has to tell Hunter and Wrecker what has happened to Omega and perhaps some tension there of Hunter and Wrecker being frustrated with Crosshair that he allowed this to happen. Um, And I don't know, it it kind of reminded me of the fact that we never saw Omega tell Crosshair what happened to Tech and we kind of missed that moment. And I kind of felt a similar feeling um, in this situation too. I agree. And I also think they're seeding a lot of things about how people don't, people outside of the Bad Batch don't necessarily trust that Crosshair is on their side. Mm -hmm. They keep bringing this up, not just in Juggernaut, but later in Flash Strike as well. And I just feel like there's some things missing a little bit about this this angstiness or they're like leading us to something that might take us by surprise and we'll look back and be like, oh, that's what that was leading to. Mm-hmm. Even though I feel like I can smell it from a mile away. You know what I mean? I totally agree with you. I feel like there's something missing here. And I, I feel the same way again about the fact that not a, I feel like I didn't get a, enough mourning of tech, to be honest. And like those are my – that's a critique I have. And then this is another one, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. I just, yeah, it's just kind of surprising. We get this line from Crosshair where he says um, the Empire would have destroyed this whole town. She stopped them, which I thought was great. But yeah, kind of what we've been saying. I just, I kind of thought we would see this moment of realization, especially for someone like Hunter, uh, to realize that Omega was taken, Crosshair allowed it. It was Omega's idea, this whole thing. I think Hunter and Wrecker would obviously come around, which it feels like they did, to the fact that this was Omega's decision. But I just feel like there would have been some hurt there uh, mm-hmm. when they found out what had happened. And I wish we would have seen that. Especially given the episode The Return, where Crosshair and Hunter Mm -hmm. were really fighting over Omega, really, and like who Omega (laughs) really likes more the most. Uh, It was honestly deeper than that, but yeah, I feel like 
they were setting us up for some tension here and that tension was either did not come to the surface or it was written out or something. There feels like there's something missing here. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, I, I do think it's interesting that Crosshair knew about Rampart as a clue about how to find Tantus and just did not bring it up until he needed to. Like That's weird. So are, are you saying you think there's a moment Crosshair could betray them in the future? Well, I wrote this in our notes where I'm just like, there's so many things that are supposed to be testing our trust for Crosshair's own quote unquote redemption to come back into the Bad Batch. And I think this is probably the proper way to handle Crosshair returning, by the way, to have these moments of questioning doubt and things like that. But given the way that the story is sort of in its own simplicity, hinting at things down the line, I don't. I worry a little bit about that, even though I don't, I do trust Crosshair because I can, I see how much he is devoted to Omega. Yeah, I think this will be an interesting thing to come back to once we do see the finale and kind of piece it all together with where Crosshair ends up. This concept of Crosshair kind of keeping this thing about Rampart and that Rampart could have information about Tantus. I don't know. I feel like they could have. If the idea is that Crosshair, as Crosshair says, Tantus wasn't ever a place he wanted to go back, and that's why he kept this information to himself. I wonder if they maybe could have seeded more of, I don't know, some comments here and there from Crosshair about not wanting to rescue the clones from Tantus. Because the past few um, weeks, we've had a lot of people kind of confirming to Omega that we're going to save the clones on Tantus, you know, and that's, that's what she's been talking about this whole time. And, and maybe I'm forgetting a line or a moment. So forgive me if so, but um, I don't know if we had seen Crosshair say something about you know, it's not important or we're never going to rescue them. I kind of feel like he did say something like that. So maybe I'm eating my own words, but I don't know. It, it might've made more clear his decision to keep this from everyone else, especially when we had, um, you know, the, what was that episode called where we have the the fight with the CX trooper in the water and we've got the rest of the clones and Rex mm -hmm. and Howler and everyone talking about how they don't trust Crosshair. And Crosshair is like, I'm giving you all the information I have. Don't you, like, you should trust me. And clearly he wasn't. So I don't know. It's something to reconcile and something to kind of keep in mind as we move towards the finale. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We do have the final introduction of Crosshair and Fee, which is fantastic. <laughs> yeah. And she says, you must be Crosshair. Tech told me all about your sparkling personality. And just, you know, I wrote in my notes, no, you're crying. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's cute. I feel I've seen so much good fan art and headcanons of people um, with like little comics and stuff on Twitter of Tech and Fee talking about Crosshair and all the other things they might have talked about together. And it's it's just been very cute um, stemming from this one little line from Fee. See, this is what I mean. We're missing some of that tech mm -hmm. mourning. And maybe we're leading towards tech being that Stop one it. trooper. Stop it. <laughs> Still crossing my fingers that that's true. But I feel like, I, uh, is it just me? Or does Fee look like she's been crying? Like her eyes look a little different to me. And I, like sadder, different. I think I might be delusional and might be reading into it, but I like yeah. this headcanon, this, this like grieving like headcanon. Where we're going. Yeah, but <laughs> I did not see it. And I gotta say, I'm kind of I kind of feel like it's not tech anymore today, day of recording. Today you feel this way? Okay. Today I feel this way, April twenty first, seven thirty PM that it's not tech. Okay. I just, we haven't seen him now in three episodes. And see, I think we're we're building to a, a fantastic crazy. return. <laughs> Today it's April twenty first, seven thirty nine PM. I feel like <laughs> I feel like we're leading towards him returning. Like I'm thinking about the glass half full. I and you're not. I so love that about you in this moment. <laughs> um I, I, I literally don't know. I waffle so much. We can check in and, at 8 o'clock and see if I've changed my mind. The but. reason the reason why I feel strongly about this is because I feel like they're not mourning tech enough. They're not spending a lot of time mourning him. It was such a big moment. I think some people and, could say, though, 
from the showrunner's perspective of we can't spend this whole season grieving tech. They've got they've 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 mentioned him multiple times. We of course have multiple emotional moments with the goggles. We have Fee bringing him up. You know, we okay, but can we compare the death of? tech to the death of Kanan in Rebels and how much airtime we got about grieving that death. Okay, I I see what you're saying, but I will caveat that by saying that it was we got a full a solid full episode essentially of just straight grieving from the Rebels crew, which was great. Mm-hmm. But this was also at the end of the season that this mm-hmm. at the end so of the are we. Yeah, but Tech mm-hmm. died a season ago. Like we can't have mm-hmm. 12 episodes of full on grieving. Well, we could have one. We could have had given one. the fact that Kane Kane yeah, we could have had one. No, I agree. We could have had one. But w- when would they have done and so, that? Because well, why so would they do that if they're if we were if we were bringing him back? That would be wasted space and wasted story. Yeah, but there was such a huge time jump in the beginning. So, the day of grieving that we would have seen on Tantus, for example, Listen, is skipped over because of I the do time feel jump. like we're switching places a little bit because I feel like I have argued the same on your side, mm-hmm. but so I don't know. So I just you can't I take like, any of our speculation seriously because we yeah. just change it the next week. <laughs> yeah, I just I I don't know. I don't no, know. No, I either. believe. Okay, I believe. I know. I I this is the classic case of me now that we're at the end of not wanting to get my hopes up too high, so I'm not disappointed when he's gone. That way, mm-hmm. I can be so overwhelmingly excited if he is in fact so true. back. Um, so true. It's, yeah, yeah. It's okay, so we're just like we're setting to like a baseline. It's a defense mechanism. Yeah, and yeah. maybe maybe we even end not knowing, mm-hmm. and then the possibility. I, I don't know if I really want that either. I'll be honest, but the possibility is that he could be in a future story. Oh, that would be such a freaking Star Wars thing to do. No, let's not. The episodes to give a done. hint. The finale is to the, hel- the helmet being removed <sighs> and seeing. And it ends. Why would you mention that? And it removing it and seeing that it is tech, and then the show ends. And then Omega going off and doing something separate. I don't know. It could end I don't know. like that uh, because my current, my last speculation about the end was that Omega was actually going to go off with Emery, and there was something that the two of them had to do because they have the scientific knowledge, right? It's if it's about right. knowledge, they've got um, a deeper knowledge than. The rest of the Bad Batch have about what the going two female on. clones and everything. Yeah, so it could end right if if it is revealed to be Tech, and Omega's like, I feel like I have to go do this thing, but I don't want to leave Tech. And the rest of the Bad Batch are like, Don't worry, we'll take care of him. We'll be here when you return, when you're ready. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> 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 we we really went off the rails here on a Tech conversation within the first ten minutes. I know. Like, I- I know. It's okay. This it's is, fine. It's fine. This is like the, this is why it's like difficult to do three episodes in one because yeah. what happens is we get on a speculation train and then we end up talking about the last one that we're talking about. Anyway, I feel like the big takeaway from Juggernaut was the fact that we're capturing Rampart. Mm-hmm. We're we're Omega's arriving at Tantus and Hemlock bringing her into the vault. So let's break down some of those pieces. First, capturing Rampart. What do we think about Rampart and being in this, uh, all these episodes, and now being along for this ride? What are what are our thoughts here? <laughs> Charlotte and I were on the Helena Marauders uh, last week to talk about Into the Breach. So, and we had a really good time talking about Rampart. And as we said on that show, we neither one of us, I think, ever expected Rampart to be back in the show. He was such a horrible <laughs> villain in the best way possible. Yeah, I hate him. I hate him. But I, we talked a little bit about this on Hollow Net Marauders, but it it's so different when you have a villain who kind of loses their power and then takes on more of a comedic role, which is definitely what I feel like happened to Rampart here um, across these couple of weeks. And I don't know. It was really fun. I laughed so much at him in a flash strike of him just screaming in the jungle. (laughs) But I, I think it was smart to bring him back 
I think the Bad Batch has done this way more often than I think a lot of other Star Wars shows have done, where totally. they're revisiting past places very frequently and past people. We actually have quite a small cast of characters over these three seasons that we've been with the Bad Batch. And I think I think they've done it so well of feeling like we know these characters in and out. So now to have had this vi- a villain like Rampart who has come in and out of the story for three seasons, I think that's really fun. And just I feel like you get to go to a deeper level with even some of these quote unquote side characters like Rampart. And uh, I won't say we get to know Rampart at a deep level. Of course, it's not like that. But it is fun to see him again, to see him in a very different position now that he is <laughs> you know, working what in a mine um, yard (laughs) and he's having, you know, he's lost all power. He's lost a razor. He's got a beard, a horrible haircut. Is it a horrible haircut? It's not a horrible haircut. You're right. I don't know why. I'm really surprised that you said that. I'm like, I meant meant like, (laughs) I guess I was thinking from Rampart's perception, he can't be, he can't groom himself. So it's probably horrible to him. But there's definitely a shade of hot (laughs) Alice happening here. I can't deny it. I won't deny it, but what I will say is that it's always cool when Star Wars changes and animation in general changes the villain character model Mm -hmm. to make them look softer. Therefore, like you said, he becomes like a comedic part of it. Yeah. Um, And that softness comes in the aesthetic and the looks and the hair being wild and things like that is is different Mm -hmm. and I think it, it fully adds something to like, oh, we're seeing a different rampart. He's still awful. He's still a villain. And we still absolutely do not trust him. They basically softened him um, as much as they could and gave him the hot callus treatment, even if I don't think that we're going to get as fleshed out of an arc that callus did in Rebels I don't really at think, all. I don't think we're really getting any kind of rampart redemption I, I, at we're all. We're not at all. We're not at all. Okay. I, I I should have been more explicit with that word, not at all. But I think that shades of what was happening with the Callus character model, I'm literally just talking about aesthetics, mm-hmm. is happening here with Rampart in order for us to soften to him a little bit and to accept him as the comedic figure. Yeah. Versus because he's an awful villain and or he's a good villain, awful person. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I there's no forgiveness that is happening here. But I can accept him in the story as someone who is going to help them and is going to be funny while he does it. Like in the next and into the breach when he's like talking about not wanting to wear the costume yeah. and the outfit because it's the wrong rank. Like that was great. That was no, pure comedy. It was very funny. Yeah. And I think that, that that couldn't have happened if they didn't change his look a little bit more. I'm spending too long talking about this, yeah. but I just need to make myself very clear. Yeah, yeah. Let's move on from Rampart uh-huh. and his hair. Let's move on. I'm sure it will it will come up again. Don't worry. Well, in, in the notes, you talked about how this juggernaut has an essence of the Mandalorian's episode, The Believer, and it totally does with the, the transport. And I think they were really pulling from The Believer there, which is one of the best episodes of The mm-hmm. Mandalorian ever. It's so good. And I I think that this whole rescue mission was done really well. And I think it's really interesting that later we find out in Flash Strike, episode 14, that the Empire knew the entire time that the Bad Batch was with Rampart. <sighs> and the thing is, is, this revelation was really big all the way in, Fla- in Flash Strike, but it shouldn't have been because obviously the Empire is going to know that Rampart's not there, right? There's going to recognize that he's missing and see some sort of camera situation, right? So that I guess that makes sense. It's it just it was a revelation and I was pretty shocked and like of course there are three steps ahead. They always are. This is the thing that Star Wars does. <laughs> the show is constantly like, "Oh, we know. We're heading to Alderaan right now, not Dantooine, you know." Stop it. So <laughs> Yeah. I, you know I was I mean. very surprised <laughs> when we found out in Flash Strike that the Empire had known all along that listen I was really surprised too but like looking back it's like oh okay yeah I think well. I guess I guess to <laughs> discover that they had put the pieces together that not only had Rampart been taken from the prison mining planet but that he showed up on that whatever their installation is above Coruscant as well and that he had been there with the rest of the Bad Batch I was 
I was like, whoa. I think that's the thing that these uh, this set of episodes really from Point of No Return to Flash Strike have done really well is they, they're kind of putting everything against the Bad Batch. You know, Crosshair missed the shot. They have to literally go get Rampart of all people. And not only that, but the Empire knew the whole time and starts attacking them as soon as they arrive on Tantus. What does Crosshair say? He says, that's not a standard formation they're expecting us. And it's it's always you're right. Star Wars does this a lot, but I think that sometimes, especially you know, in our larger conversation of who is this show targeted towards, like younger audiences, I think sometimes it's easy to feel like you know the stormtrooper always doesn't hit their target, so of course the good guys win. You know what I mean? And I feel like in these uh, this last kind of chunk of the Bad Batch they've really not been doing very well. They've been moderately successful mm-hmm. at best. <laughs> they're barely getting they're, by. They, I mean, yeah, they're hanging on by the skin of their teeth. And the fact, yeah, I was very shocked when we found out that that the Empire knew all along. And I thought it was a good reveal for Flash Strike, uh, especially seeing where the end of Into the Breach uh, ended with, you know, Hunt, if we're talking about hot moments, Hunter at the end of Into the Breach, when Rampart is saying they shouldn't do it, they're about to make the jump, the the science vessel is about to make the jump, and they still haven't gotten the coordinates from uh, Echo that their shield or whatever is turned off. Please don't get me on the terminology here. <laughs> but Rampart, like, I'm like, you're really talking through this. I'm really going for it. <laughs> I think they do call it, I think uh, Hemlock calls it a science vessel, so... I think that's correct. <laughs> but when they latch on to said science vessel and they don't know if Echo has been successful yet and Rampart is trying to get them to turn around, he says, abort the mission. And we just get this, the most intense I think we've ever seen Hunter look. And he just goes negative. And then they book it. And I, it was pretty hot. It, it, it was, yeah. yeah. Well, I was just on the edge of my seat for that entire moment. It was, yeah, it was. They drew it, it, was it so out. Good. They drew it out yeah. a lot. And yeah. the tension was really there. It really was. And I think, you know, aside from, you know, the protective side of Hunter, like I said earlier, we're really seeing the Bad Batch do anything and everything. And if we can put aside kind of the weirdness of Crosshair not talking about Rampart, the fact that he is you know, he's finally revealing this information says a lot about how he feels about the situation and the fact that they put themselves, they go directly on to this Imperial ship above Coruscant to find a way to Tantis with an ex Imperial officer. It's just, (laughs) it's such an intense mission and such a dangerous mission as well. And that proves to be true because they, the Empire knew the whole time. They weren't even successful in it, technically speaking. So uh, they really are going to do anything to get Omega back. And they've been hit so many times now in this whole process. But they will all be successful <laughs> in the finale. They will. They will. They will. Uh, they will. All of them will be successful. Okay. Every We're willing this. single one, even tech. <laughs> It's already written. It's already done. Like, we know. We don't know. But we know. (laughs) Just to be clear, we have not seen the finale. We have not seen it. We have no idea. (laughs) We did not have screeners for the finale. So, yeah. Anyway, this was a really fun episode, though. I think it, you know, it also, it reminded me of The Believer, but it also reminded me, I think there's some some of Solo in this. I think there's a little bit of Andor in this sequence and this type of setup. It also reminded me a lot of Rebels season four opener when they're rescuing Sabine's father, also from a prison transport. So we've seen this type of structure in a lot of different places in Star Wars, and it's always pretty effective. And I like the kind of contained environment of a prison and how these different groups kind of operate within them in order to complete the mission. I feel like we always get kind of um, a little bit of an Indiana Jones callback as well. Usually Mm -hmm. someone's like under the prison transport ship, Mm -hmm. like Indias and Raiders, and that's Mm -hmm. always fun to see. It gets very physical. Yeah, exactly, yeah. All right, so the one thing we haven't talked about yet with Juggernaut is, of course, now we get to come back to our favorite conversation of what is Omega? And we get a little bit more. What is going on <laughs> with Omega? <laughs> just, just, how many times can we talk about this and have I know, different answers? I know. Uh, we get a little bit more um, 
exposition from Hemlock here about what's going on. And while I appreciate another paragraph of text from Hemlock about (laughs) another (laughs) piece of exposition about this blood situation, I still find myself confused. And I think that's on me. (laughs) No, no. It seems like most people that we've talked about are talked to about this are like, yeah, (sighs) just the blood, man. Like, I'm not sure. I don't think Omega's like a Jedi, but something <laughs> special about her. So, uh, all right, let's let's read this text. That's where it comes down to. Let's read this text. So, okay. someone I I didn't write down who said this. I think maybe Omega uh, Emery says this. Of her blood sample yielded a favorable M count replication. So then here is what Hemlock says to Omega as he's taking her to the vault, which I also thought this was a very effective scene of tension, very similar to the end of Into the Breach, where she's just kind of going all through the hallway, the laser Phantom Menace hallway and everything. Exactly. It should be noted that another thought is that we're seeing all the different obstacles in which she ha- would have to go through to get out. in order to escape the vault. So we see the big Phantom Menace laser situation, which we already know you cannot pass through and t- unless they're turned off. We see door after door after door. Or she's getting deeper and deeper within, which is really devastating, especially watching this back. This, this I've watched this episode twice. Like watching that after knowing that she goes in it and it was a surprise the first time. But after after it, it's like, oh, no, you're going real deep in there. Yeah, girl. But it, you like, say that, but she she already found a no, new way out. So she knew that totally. was a viable path. But yeah, correct. Yeah, which we'll talk about that in a minute. So here's what Hemlock says about the M count. <laughs> he says, did you know an individual's M count cannot be directly replicated? Attempts have been made, but each time the level is degraded. And so we experimented. We tried various methods, mixing samples, our other test subjects, yet nothing worked. Until we combine your sample with one of our M count specimens, you are a vital piece to our work here, Omega. And Omega says, who are they? Hemlock responds, they are the rest of the puzzle, and this is your new home. And that's when we... So they are the kids. Yes, the M count specimens, so four sensitive children... And the four sensitive children are the ones that are inside the vault with Omega. Correct. So what they're doing is combining Omega's blood with their blood in order to create a clone of them. Uh Uh-huh. I feel like I just had a little bit of a moment of clarity with this and it's it's already gone. I'm not going (laughs) to lie. Like I just I spoke it out loud. I'm like, okay, that's that makes sense. I but think, it's not like we really see that. Yeah, I think what I'm so I think I'm pretty set on that Omega's blood is a binder. So it protects the M count from being degraded when Can they just say that? Can they just say your blood is a binder? I mean, we still got a finale to go. <laughs> we'll, another paragraph of text from Hemlock. <laughs> when you say that, do you think that we're gonna learn more about this? Because I, I feel like we've We've fed a, been fed a lot. Like, I actually don't know if there's more here. I don't that. I don't know. The question that I still have, though, is so take Eva, right? The kid Eva. So when they take Eva's blood and Omega's blood and they put it together, when are they injecting it into someone else to make them force sensitive? Or That's are the they question. cloning Eva and or Omega to make a force sensitive clone of either one of them? I don't think we have that answer. Okay. I would think that it's the first one that you mentioned, which is injection. That would be more beneficial to the empire. Yes. But I I could see them doing both. But I I think it's more the first one given like we've seen the Zillow Beast. And there was always something funky about the Zillow Beast, yeah. right? We know about um, them experimenting on clones that are already there, like Crosshair, potentially even Tech. I don't know. Who knows, man? But anyway, they, they're experimenting on clones. So I don't think they're cloning those clones. I think they're injecting them with it, which is like just like nasty. Like we're dealing with gross things, <laughs> right? And <laughs> I just I I feel like okay, so to my earlier question of do you think we're gonna get more? We'll probably will get clarity on that specifically, especially with us seeing the Zillow Beast at the end of Flash Strike. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah. All right. Okay. So, <laughs> so are, how are you feeling about this now? About her, her, her specialness. 
Yes. I think I'm glad that she's not force sensitive. I know this was something we had talked about earlier in the season, especially with the return of Asajj Ventress back in the Harbinger. And I'm glad she's not force sensitive. And I'm glad I I feel pretty confident about that. So overall, I think the rest is just another piece of the scientific experiments that the Empire is doing. And how she is involved in it. And I feel like she pro I feel like Omega probably understands what she is now, even though we don't, because I think she's mm-hmm. smarter than us. But yeah, I, I I think I feel pretty good right now of her as a binder, of keeping that terminology okay. to myself for myself okay. until well, you're not. Otherwise. You're sharing it with all of our listeners. Well I yeah. I mean <laughs> I mean that's how I'm going to understand it moving forward okay. until told otherwise by Hamlock. Right. Okay. So let's move on to episode 13, Into the Breach, then. Let's go. So the big things about this episode, Omega really conducts a lot of research and trials to try to escape the vault. And against all odds, the Batch is able to make the jump to Tantus. And it was really stressful there for a second. So, <laughs> um, But the thing that I really wanted to talk about is particularly in Into the Breach is the fact that we got a lot of circle imagery. So much circle imagery, it was like the only thing I could think about after watching it. We get this insane view of Tantus from above, making it look like a round circle, almost like the Apple campus, to be honest. I was thinking about that recently. I was looking at the <laughs> screenshot from it, and I'm like, this is giving Apple campus. Anyway. Um, the <laughs> okay. Um, but at the, you know, like super futuristic. Type I know, I looking. got it. It was just I wasn't. You didn't put Apple in our notes, so it just kind of no, came out I was of just, nowhere. I was looking at it like, huh, that's it's funny. What I really wanted to talk about though is we get this insane circle imagery. We get we get Omega using the game to show the way that the vault is organized. She lays out tiles that look like it's a big circle with like prongs coming out of it and things like that. And then we get the overhead shot of Mount Tantus. We also have previously discussed how we are dealing with two mountains with Pabu and Tantus here. There's a lot of parallelism that's happening. And then, of course, like separate from the game in which Omega is showing, the entire vault is just very interestingly designed with just it being very easy to see into. And there's just several circles going on. But the first thing that I thought of was the Empire logo, which is a circle within a circle. And if you're if you're unfamiliar with it right now, Google it. But I don't think people listening to this are that unfamiliar with it. The logo has always really gotten me. Like I feel like it's really interesting. I, I we need to do a deep dive episode into the design of some of these logos that Star Wars has gone mm-hmm. in gone with for years and years and years that they become iconic. Like where does this even come from? It's so interesting. Um, anyway, but the the Empire logo is basically two layers of circles, which is basically Mount Tantus as well. And this also was so interesting to me when in Revenge of the Sith, Vader is being operated on and it the way that it it's definitely paralleled to Padme being giving birth as well in terms of shots. But the way that Vader being operated on, the entire floor is in the Empire logo as well. So I feel like we've been trained almost to look for these kind of things. And so I don't know. I just think it's quite interesting that the escape plan that Omega is hatching is in in the shape, basically, of the Empire logo. And it makes me think that this overhead shot of Tantus perhaps is also showing us that probably the vault is deep within. And so when you look at the Empire logo, there's a circle, the smallest circle within the center. And then outside of it are these things that are jutting out from around. They have folks on a wheel. So it's interesting to think about how they're able to use those basically to escape. It makes me think of the beginning when Omega was escaping, the beginning of season three, and how she was able to use Batcher and the dog door basically to get out and how that was like essentially a tunnel. And if we look at the empire logo, it, you can kind of tell that maybe there's, is it visualizing tunnels as well? Is that, is, or can we overlay the empire logo on top of Mount Tantus and think that this is how it's structured as well? And will that play into the way that the batch escapes? I have no idea, but I think it's interesting to think about circles and circling back and things like that. We've often talked on the show about how the beginning of the season 
Omega, we already had a prison escape of Tantus. And it seems like the series is going to end again on a Tantus escape. And what are each of these escapes going to tell us? I don't know, but it's fun to think about the format of like circling back quite literally. Yeah. Uh, you can go really deep with it, I think. <laughs> but I, I'm like, ah, they're telling us something with these circles, man. And it's fun to di- dive in. I mean, you could you could go even one further layer and be like, okay, we're really following the hero's journey monomyth circle and cycle. And here we go with the circle again, right? Yeah. I don't know. It's fun. Well, I, I think this idea of circling back, this is what I was saying earlier of we keep coming back to similar characters and places mm-hmm. throughout the Bad Batch, even thinking about Crosshair and coming back to the Vulture planet, the return. Why story in, in this larger story of the Bad Batch, why is it important to be coming back to these places rather than going to, you know, a new place where Crosshair and Hunter have an emotional discussion or Omega gets taken to a new prison that they still have to find the coordinates to, you know what I mean? So I think there's definitely something here of a uh, return of r- rebirth, circling back, circling back to tech, you know, a rebirth of tech, there could be a lot here. <laughs> <laughs> you really brought it. To tech. I, I brought it. I circled back. I circled us back. <laughs> but no, I, I agree with a lot of what you were saying about circles. I think these shapes are things that, like you mentioned, have become so iconic in Star Wars and similar to a red lightsaber, meaning one thing, uh, I think a circle in an evil setting like this, we are supposed to be kind of creating almost like a vision board, a mood board for the types of stylistic and visual motifs that an Mm -hmm. imperial location would use. And I, I think it's all part of that kind of mood board aesthetic for an imperial prison. Yeah, but even above that, like when we were first introduced to the Empire logo, again, I don't know the history and this is why I think we should probably do an episode on this, but it's been part of Star Wars iconography for as long as, certainly as long as I have been familiar with Star Wars. Yeah. And the Empire logo, you can analyze it. I hope everyone's looking at it so it's not just I'm <laughs> talking into the wind and or people just really remember it. But the small circle within, if you look at it and think about episode four, a new hope and think about how does this relate to the empire and the story that we're telling. It looks like a circle is a death star, right? Like it could yeah. be a death star. And then the inside of it is the core that explodes and it's exploding out. Yeah. And so are we going to experience a similar internal explosion on Tantus than we would for the death star? The most iconic climax really of any sort of, I don't know, going back to the beginning of what we're familiar with when it comes to Star Wars, right? If we're leading towards Mount Tantus being destroyed and then also the medical records within it also being destroyed, because what we know is that they're not able to complete this cloning issue and this cloning process until way in the Mandalorian. They're in, they're not even really done. They're working on it like constantly. And that's why Grogu is so important. So they're probably not going to be able to get anything that is in Mount Tantus right now done. So what happens? Does it get destroyed? Are we going to experience a Death Star type explosion? Uh, a destroying of this area? I mean, we've already seen Topoka City be destroyed. Why couldn't Mount Tantus be destroyed as well? And does that come with it from within and is within the vault? And like, how are we going to get to this point? Um, and is this all built into the circle iconography? It's, these are the questions that we should be asking ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> You've asked them. <laughs> I've asked them. They're out there in the universe. I think I definitely think that Tantus is going to be destroyed. I think it mm-hmm. will be destroyed. Either I I think the Zillow Beast will destroy it. I think they're going to let mm-hmm. the Zillow Beast out, and I think maybe we'll get another overhead shot of the Zillow Beast coming straight out of the top of the mountain and right blowing it up. Uh, that's yeah. That's how I think. That's how I think it ends <laughs> with the destruction of of Mount Tantus. The other thing that would be interesting to discuss is: Have you noticed that there's another peak behind Mount Tantus, another little mountain? Yes, I was going to say this is this this is something we also talked a lot about on Hollow Net Marauders. That I think they brought up is that there are other mountains and what's going on <laughs> in the other mountains. <laughs> so it's like uh-huh. great. Well, I will bring us back to the 
every episode mention There's of Jurassic always Park. Always a bigger fish. That, oh, okay. Well, there is always a bigger fish. That's also part of it. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. In Jurassic Park, the original Jurassic Park, obviously, it all ends with them leaving and destroying and abandoning Jurassic Park. But you find out in the Lost World that there was another island that was also doing like backup experiments. So that was like basically carbon copying what was happening at the main park of Jurassic Park. And like, this is where most of the experiments were happening. Um, I don't necessarily think that that is like one for one, probably what we're going to get. But I think the concept of, no, there's two different sites is really interesting and maybe something that will be hinted at at the end of the series if Mount Tantus, the one that we know that they're in, is fully destroyed. Because they... I'm sure that they will be trying to make file copies of other things. This is something we deal with in Rogue One, right? But I feel like it would be interesting if they were like, yeah, they destroyed one. We're going to have to start from maybe 15% versus zero based off of what we have. And that's that was really brought up in Jurassic Park. And yeah. Well, they, there must be something that is saved for them to mm -hmm. have success later on in The Mandalorian. I would be Correct. curious to know if they end up doing it at, you know, the mountain next door. Because I, it, if there is something happening in that mountain next door, then I feel like it has to be something to do with the cloning. Because I don't think that Hemlock, who, like we've talked about, has this blank check from Palpatine and is clearly so secretive about where Tantus is, would be letting you know, HR, the Imperial HR be in the mountain next door, right? Like this is his planet, his secret spot. No one else can be there. <laughs> so I think if, if something is happening or if they end up going to the other mountain, it will be to do with the cloning. Or if we find out something's happening in the other mountain, it will be akin to this cloning and not something else happening within the Imperial world. The other thing that I wanted to just kind of reference from our conversation on Hollow Nut Marauders was, uh, and I think I think their host Jamie brought this up, but it was about the fact that Pabu has gotten progressively darker as the season has gone on, whereas shots of Tantus have actually gotten progressively lighter. So there's kind of this juxtaposition between them, which if we're thinking about the finale and where everything is going to go, obviously a lighter aesthetic kind of feels more like a happy ending you know what I mean so I think totally. there will be success and rescue of the children of the clones I think I think we will get a happy ending here and there will be the widespread destruction of Tantus <sighs> but what will come with it I don't know mm -hmm. um so some sort of sacrifice I've been saying it from the very beginning, right, then what's some the, sort of what's sacrifice. What's the sacrifice, Charlotte? Don't know. What's the Don't sacrifice? Know. We've got one episode left. <laughs> Don't know. You just, we'll you just find keep out. throwing out sad things with <laughs> nothing to back I do. Up. You're right. <laughs> no solid <laughs> That is something I am doing. <laughs> <laughs> you got mad at me earlier for my tech is actually dead. You're like, that's not me. Half glass full. <laughs> no. But I, I have always been like, I don't know if the sacrifice is a person. I think it's just like the sacrifice maybe of the group as we know it. Okay. Yeah. And it's so se and so se it's separating. Okay. So all right. If that's, that's what you're different. saying, if that's what you're saying, the sacrifice. I've been saying that. But you okay? okay. Okay. We have had this conversation, but I don't think we've connected it to what you've been calling like the final sacrifice. Okay. I think we have, but it's okay if you don't remember. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> we, I know we've I, had this conversation, but we've also talked about members dying. Yeah. I think it's not off. I don't think it's off the table, obviously, but I, I just, yeah, I, I feel like there is definitely something there about the light and the light changing. And I bet there will be ultimate sort of nature renewal that comes with it. I mean, yeah, the thing is, is Tantus is filled with crazy beasts. We keep seeing them and they're wild. And it's clear that this planet is an animal's planet. Yeah. And it's maybe that's what we're leading to. I think, again, with the circles, we've already referenced this before, but there was a curious thing about like the zoo transport of creatures that happened in the earlier season. And those creatures were let go. And we keep referencing this, but like, are we going to get something similar to that where zoo creatures are let out of their pens? I don't know. We'll see. I'm, I, I feel like I keep bringing that up, but I... I, I don't know. There's something interesting that's happening with the aesthetic of Tantus with the nature 
and the fact that we keep seeing these wild beasts and how the empire is there and yeah they're, they're definitely going to lose to nature i think is of course this is star wars yeah so. nature versus machine so but I, i'm it'll be great if that is included in part of the destruction of tantus yeah and i think it will be especially with, especially with the zillow beast okay. all right so let's talk about omega now within you know into the breach and flash strike you know her actually within the vault and everything that she has going on she immediately jumps into action gathering intel making a plan gathering supplies my girl is on it she is on it <laughs> i know she really is on it she really jumps into it and is like you know what i'm we're gonna escape i'm here she doesn't even rest for one night honestly i mean she does rust for one night. <laughs> i shouldn't say that but i feel like you had some questions about how much time passes from when Omega is basically thrown into the vault to when she meets the kids or like when this episode starts. And I honestly think it's one night. She wakes up and is like immediately, who who are my friends? How can I help them? What's the deal? And who's watching us? And we're definitely going to break out. I yeah. felt like there was such a great moment also that happened musically where partial bits of the Bad Batch theme started to play in this heroic sense. And we haven't really heard it in its full glory in a long, long time. I think they're really saving it for the finale. Well, we heard it in Harbinger. That's true. But it, it's rare. It's not every episode, and yeah. it's certainly not every other episode either. Yeah. And I think that we're really building up to them playing it in sort of huge fanfare and they sort of hinted at it a little bit with Omega here forming this plan and getting everyone sort of excited and knowing that she's going to be able to do it and we all we all trust her uh because she's done it before yeah I love how she tells the other kids that too of you know mm -hmm. I'll tell you I've I've actually already escaped from Tanta so we're gonna do it mm -hmm. again I think the thing that I kind of keep thinking about in when we were seeing Omega in the vault is that she still has faith that Crosshair made the shot I know. and he didn't make the shot <laughs> but he's he's there oh so gosh. it's fine they're all there it doesn't matter he's there I know he's, he's there. there and she of course she says that in the next episode of uh my brothers are here uh they found me my brothers just mm. so great i wrote in our it notes, really was it was pretty epic it was really epic i wrote in our notes were better words ever spoken <laughs> right totally no. like it was it was so great it was really great it was like yes they're here yeah. they're here they arrived and they're they're causing a ruckus well, let's not forget that the finale is called the calvary has arrived i know so I, yeah but i i think that omega here in the vault really reminded me a lot of the season three finale of the clone wars where ahsoka is headhunted on that planet by trend oceans right and there are other ex-Padawans, lost Padawans, I should say, on that planet. And a lot of them have lost hope, don't know what to do. Like many of them have been killed off. And Ahsoka is the one who arrives and leads them to freedom, to safety. She rescues them. And I thought I always think that such one of the best conversations, I think, between Anakin and Ahsoka at the end of that arc where Anakin is apologizing for not being able to rescue her. And Ahsoka says, because of your training, you did save me and it helped me to save others. And that was because of your training. And I kind of think we're going to get a similar parallel to Omega and the rest of the Bad Batch. I think, I think she's absolutely going to get the kids out of the vault. I think she'll be responsible for getting them out of the vault, leading them to safety, uh, freeing the Zillow Beast and kind of causing even a bigger ruckus than the Bad Batch. I could very easily see the Bad Batch kind of being a distraction <laughs> for everyone in Tantus with them not realizing that Omega is actually the one causing problems here. And she has led the M the other the other kids, M count specimens, uh, to freedom and to safety. So I think I would I would love to see a cute little conversation like that um, between Omega and Hunter and Crosshair and Wrecker and Echo too. But it, do you think we're going to have time for that? For a cute little conversation, we better. <laughs> <laughs> there are no more cute conversations. Are you telling me there will be no more cute conversations? We're kind of running out of time. It's making me a little nervous. When you were talking about it, I was like, Where's the conversation going to be? There's, there's a lot of work to be done. There's definitely going to be conversation. You're right. Because, you're right, because you're right. At least one cute little conversation. <laughs> only one. I there could only be one because they'll they'll probably be separated for 
Exactly. The, the reunion might not come until the very end, which I hope not. I think, I don't know, they could run into each other in the hallway and the Bad Batch is like, we thought you were in the vault. And she's like, that's old school. I, I've been out for hours. Let's go. <laughs> right. I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, I think to kind of wrap up a little bit of, Ome- of Omega's story, it's, you know, we, we've been a broken record this season about just how incredible she is and how grown up and not, you know, we're talking about Omega rescuing everyone. And I think we're forgetting about the rest of the clones as well on Kansas. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I'm sure she's going to, that's also going to be a part of her larger uh, actions next week in the finale. So I don't know. I'm just, I'm very excited to see what she does. She led the escape last time and I think she will lead it again. And it's all part of that. Omega is ready for the next stage in her life, which maybe is not with the Bad Batch in the same way that it it has been for the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. So anyway, you know, it would be really cool if Crosshair is really involved in leading this escape Mm -hmm. too that we're going to get in the finale, if we get that. Um, I'm speaking so confidently here about the an escape. No, but they could protect- completely take a left turn and do something different. No, but no, I think that they're going to get out of it. I just think that I'm what I'm picturing is a prison escape, and yeah. I wonder if they're just gonna do something completely different. Like I, I don't know. Yeah, but it would be really great if Crosshair really took a leadership moment with that, mm-hmm. given what we talked about about 30 minutes ago with all these different pieces of people not fully trusting Crosshair. Yeah. Even though we, the audience, ha- I'm speaking for myself, do based off of what we've seen him have a relationship with Omega and really trust her and everything that goes with that, right? Yeah. And I think that, but there's several people around him who don't. And what would it mean if he was also really involved in this prison escape maybe it's that clone component because he's the one that knows where all of that is right yeah and something we learned in this episode or the other one one of these episodes <laughs> is that you know he he knew that about rampart he knew like he he's keeping things underneath his skin and i feel like that's also a piece of it like does he know where where things are located within mount tantus that like maybe he hasn't really shed light on before And does he become like a really key player in that? And I think he probably will, given his storyline and his arc, especially in this season. But I think that that will be really meaningful if that happens. Yeah, I I think you're right. I think he will, especially given his journey with the clones um, on the return planet, the Mm -hmm. outpost. One day I'll get the planet of that place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But his relationship with all of those clones, I think, really set the stage for him moving forward and his perception of the regs. Um, I think we should also, I I wrote down this quote, this little conversation he had with Wrecker when they're trekking through the forest on Tantus. And he says, I've been here before. It's not a place you forget. And Wrecker, ever the mood lightener, says, you broke out of here once. At least now you're breaking in. And Crosshair... (laughs) Glumly responds, I'd rather not do either, but Omega didn't leave me behind when she could have. I owe her. And Mm -hmm. it's just, it's a good, it's a good little conversation. And then we also have, you know, in our conversation of Crosshair, his moment with Rampart, where Rampart says, you used to believe good soldiers followed orders. And Crosshair says, depends on who's giving them. The Empire betrayed us both. And you think you can fight them. That's not you. You're like me, loyal to no one but yourself. And Crosshair says, I've changed before he walks off. And then kind of ominously by him to himself, Hemlock says, sure you have. And... I think Crosshair definitely has this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier with what is Crosshair going to do in the finale. I think he's like we said, he's, he's here for Omega and that's what he's going to do. And I think he'll do more if he can, but we know where his priority is. Whereas I think Rampart, when he says you're loyal to no one, but yourself, that is Rampart. And that's where I think we're going to leave Rampart too. He's not loyal to the empire anymore, but He's not loyal to anyone else either. And yeah. he gets captured by the Imperials at the end of Flash Strike. So that's going to be a problem. Mm-hmm. It is. But maybe not the biggest issue since they already knew he was with them anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was so glad that Echo came back in this episode. I feel like we've had very few pieces of him in the season. And of course he's coming back. Of course he's in the finale. And... 
I I thought particularly in Flash Strike, he was so good. Yeah. And <laughs> um, I don't want to skip too far ahead in that, or, or maybe we can, but I, I think that what he was doing in Flash Strike was so great, just like him being off on his own and the fact that he, he takes a, a stormtrooper's hand and uses it as his own. I mean... <laughs> He says thanks for the hand. Like, <laughs> I, I, he's the king of comedy. It makes me think of uh, that I'm Echo. Did you hear an Echo? I'm Echo. That yeah. whole exchange that happened in season one that was just like so funny. And yeah, I'm just really glad that he's back. Yeah, he definitely was kind of the MVP, I think, as far as the technicality of what they needed to yes. do between Into the Breach and Flash Strike. He, they, they really wouldn't have done it without him. So the fact that he was able to get in through, through the little droid vacuum that sucks him up and he comes back out. At the, <laughs> so great. The minute, so good. the minute I saw that thing, I was like, that's where he's going. Can't wait. <laughs> it really was so great. It, it was pretty funny. But I think, you know, we have to talk about his conversation with Emery at the end of Flash Strike because we've talked a ton about Emery. She, of course, had her episode Identity Crisis where it was her identity crisis. And, you know, if things have crossed a line for her, which it really feels like they have crossed a line for her. Yeah. She yeah. immediately recognizes that it's Echo, which is honestly pretty impressive considering she's only going off of the freaky hand, <laughs> which maybe that's kind of obvious, but, uh, you know, she she calls out that it's Echo and they have a little back and forth and he says, Omega saw something in you. I want to believe she was right. Tell me where she is. And uh, Emery responds, if we're going to free those children, you're going to have to trust me. So very clearly, I think we can say we're hashtag team Emery now mm -hmm. and yeah I was really glad that we had I, I was kind of surprised to see I guess one of the members of the Bad Batch be caught by the end but the fact that he's caught by Emery and you know in the beginning of the season Emery tells on Crosshair and Omega she actively tries to prevent them from stopping but now she's in a completely different place she's you know she's had her character arc of the season and now she's ready to be part of the plan to rescue all of the children although I guess that could also be part of her ending too if she doesn't go off with Omega of returning all of the children to their mm -hmm. homes um, that would be a good ending for Emery do you think we're gonna see Nala say ever again I, I think we might. She could be part of the sacrifice because she's mm -hmm. imprisoned. And mm. yeah, that would be pretty sad. But I don't know. What, do you think we'll see her again? Well, I wonder if Emery if is going to be part of getting the children out. Like, would she also feel a duty to relieving Nala Say from working for the Empire? Possibly. Yeah. She did leave it pretty tense with Nala Say the last time, but totally. I think she kind of understands more what Nala Say said exactly. when Nala Say said, I did what I could for them and that things would have actually been worse for them if Omega hadn't escaped given the yes. binding and everything like that. Yes. And I, I think that maybe she feels a kinship almost to what Nala Say was doing and how much pressure was on her back because now Emery's dealing with that as well. Yeah. So we also I don't know. Like I really thought it was so in, so interesting that Emery re first off recognizes Echo, and then it made me think that maybe there there's something lonely about Omega feeling like she was the only female clone, mm -hmm. right? And then Emery, I remember Omega being like, I didn't know that they were female ones just like I didn't know that there were more of me and I think Emery sort of never bit at that she never really mm -hmm. talked about that with her and I I do think that she always felt a kinship towards Omega obviously we've seen this throughout this entire season from the straw doll and everything like that right but I think that through Omega talking about her brothers does she feel like man that could have been me or it would be nice to have some kinship because I feel so alone here. Like even the people that I work with <laughs> don't even really like me. So <laughs> I, yeah. And I feel like that was a moment of, I recognize you echo. How can I, we'll see where it goes, but I, I just had to think about all the different feelings that maybe Emery was feeling in that moment. Yeah. I think for her, it's kind of all about 
rescuing the kids now. And I, I thought her conversation with the other doctor whose name, like Dr. Sculter or Skul- Sculter or something like that, the sure. one with the blunt bangs, mm-hmm. um, that their conversation was kind of fascinating where the the bang – the blunt bangs doctor she already sees the writing on the wall that it's a bad idea to have omega in the vault and i i kind of feel that emery also knows it's a bad idea to have omega in the vault yeah. but not really like she's pro omega escaping now along with everyone else so mm-hmm. i think to her it's almost kind of strategic to have omega in the vault um i think yeah. hemlock put her there ultimately but I don't know. I also kind of think maybe Emery could have influenced that decision because she says kind of snappily to the the bang doctor, the blunt bang doctor of, you know, I'll run the vault how I see fit. And mm-hmm. the, the other doctor is so against it and, you know, is always checking in on Omega. And of course, of course, Omega outsmarts her. But <laughs> I thought that that was a really interesting little moment because – that was obviously before the conversation with Echo. And I remember watching that and thinking, I really think that Emery wants Omega to be doing the thing she's doing in the vault. Yes. I just think that there was a line a couple episodes ago of Hem- her talking to Hemlock and being like something about, I, can't, I don't have it in front of me, but something about how you, the way that she was treated, like she said something like, Oh, Tanala say. Tanala say. Like, oh, they're just like me, like they're being experimented on just like me or something like that. Like throwing, uh, I think it was something about like you're throwing them out when you're done or something like that. Exactly. Throwing them out when you're done. Yeah. So I think that there is a sense of like, oh, the Bad Batch found themselves and are not accepting being thrown out when they're done. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that she is even accepting that, but I do think that she feels a sense of jealousy a little bit there or what could have been. Mm. Let me Maybe. see if it comes up in, in a non-cute conversation in the finale. <laughs> <laughs> totally. So basically the end of this arc, this three-episode arc, right, we have um, uh, Echo asking what other children, right? They obviously have no intel. And I think this was actually really smart because, you know, the Echo and Rex and everyone have a lot of information about Tantus, but mm-hmm. they still don't really even have – a lot of information about Tantus. Yeah, they don't know anything. Yeah, they don't know. and it's just another yeah. reminder of how evil the Empire really is, that there is, there's always another another layer deeper, another concentric circle, uh, an even bigger vault somewhere else. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And then mm-hmm. Omega tells the other kids that she has a plan after she's gone, you know, through all of the different uh, cables and Found the Zillow Beast. Found the Zillow Beast wild uh, that she has a plan. And it was definitely a very a, a very hopeful ending, I would say, given what we've talked about over the Bad Batch kind of continually being bested in a lot of ways over across these couple of episodes. So we're heading into the finale. Everyone is at Tantus. Um, Wrecker, Hunter, Crosshair, and not really Rampart, but kind of Rampart. They're all still out in the jungle. Echo and Emery are in the lab. Omega's in the vault with the other kids. The Zillow Beast is there. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's going to be a crazy finale. Uh, I think it's going to be very action-packed. Do you think that Hunter and everyone is going to stay outside? So then there's several – like if I were to design the escape from within, mm-hmm. the way that the escape went – in the beginning of the season was very different because they were doing it alone. But what if Emery and Echo help Omega break out and move outside of the Tantus Mountain and then the rest of the Bad Batch are like outside? I don't even know. I really have no idea. I think we might also – I think there's a possibility for us to have a similar Rogue One type of ending, not in all of the sacrifice, hear me out, but in the transmission of location. And you mentioned Mm -hmm. this earlier of like copying of data, but also for the location of Tantus to be transmitted out because that's also a huge thing that's being held very secret. So if Echo and Emery start – if Echo starts sending out the coordinates to Tantus, are there more people, the, the rest of the Calvary, to arrive, right? Or is mm-hmm. it just the Bad Batch? I could see it going either way. I think that's something that could happen. I think I don't know if comms are on between Echo and Hunter and Wrecker and Crosshair. So 
if he could clue them in. I kind of feel like Echo and Emery, that Emery might help get the rest of the Bad Batch into Mount Tantis secretly, and then they'll kind of start going from there. It's definitely curious that if we want to talk about repeating patterns, that Camino started off as a place that you couldn't find that was a race from the maps. Mm -hmm. And Tantis was also a a race from the maps. And we saw the destruction of Topoka City from the Empire and people being able to find it on maps again. So again, if we're talking about parallels, are we going to see the destruction of Mount Tantis and then people being able to find it on maps again? I don't know. I think so. I mean, I'll bring up again that season one ended with the destruction of Kamino, but also this ending of Crosshair and Omega on the platform. And this season has kind of been all about them as well. So just going to sprinkle that there again, I guess. (laughs) Right. I, I think I think we're gearing up for a pretty iconic finale. I can't wait. Mm-hmm. I have already said my piece about how I think it's going to go. <laughs> but yeah, I think these we'll are our final see shots. Some, yeah, some of a uh, completion of Omega's hero's journey mm-hmm. and her bre- bringing forth the elixir. I don't know what that's going to be. And if you're unfamiliar with that, what that means, it's purely metaphorical but it honestly might not be given the science of it all (laughs) i wonder if there's a way to nullify the effects of her blood somewhere in tantis and if it's like a that's interesting she could if it's a risk for her to take that or something and she does it because without her what if that like accelerates her growth or something okay okay I take it back. I take it back. <laughs> what if we see like an adult Omega at the end of this? I think I... What would be the craziest thing that we could see in this finale? Okay. I hadn't really talked about this because it felt a little spoilery to me, but Michelle Ong talked about the finale a little bit in the roundtable interviews that we did at the beginning of the season. So if you've listened to that, you you might remember what she what she discussed, but I feel like we've tried to not really talk about it here on the show, just, you know, in case. But... This is what I texted Charlotte after the interview because Charlotte wasn't able to be there. But I said, the last Michelle tidbit is that she said the last two lines for Omega sum her up and that they had essentially recorded different versions of the finale. I think maybe there was like one other version. I'm not quite sure. The first version, Omega's feature was more wide open and Michelle had grown really attached to it. But then they changed it and she had said it was a little sad and that Michelle had to readjust to the new finale. So... Now, I haven't re-listened to that interview, so I'm not even sure exactly how accurate my my text to Charlotte was at the time. But I think that, I don't know. I, I, I'm i very curious to read into Michelle's uh, description yeah. of the finale of there was one version that felt really wide open and then another one that was not quite as wide open, I think is kind of the takeaway uh, from it. So what does that mean? And and I think the word she used was maybe a little sad too. So maybe I need to go re-listen to that interview. But I really think that that's where our theories about like Omega going off on her own come from. Because what is a little sad is her leaving the Bad Batch, right? Right. Yeah. And I or like someone dying. But I I in general I think it's uh, if it's a little sad, (laughs) I think it's her leaving the Bad Batch for something different or better for her. Um, and like going off on her own. Maybe she goes off with Echo. Like maybe she's with Rex and everyone else trying to she could, help yeah. the clones. Like, and maybe that's just a little sad because that's not what the rest, like the hun- Hunter and Wrecker and everyone, maybe they're not on the same page or something. Who knows? We'll yeah. see. Again, what would be the craziest thing to see? Palpatine again? Snoke? Oh my God. <laughs> If we see an early version of Snoke in a jar. What if we do? We could. Grogu? We could. No. I don't want Grogu to be there either. <laughs> no, because Grogu's in hiding this whole time. Yeah. I guess that's not true. Like, I think. We don't, yeah, we don't know. Yeah, we don't full, know. The full timeline of Grogu yet. So, no, I don't. I don't think there necessarily needs to be a big cameo or reveal in this finale. I think, and maybe... 
to that point, there's not even going to be more of a Calvary that arrives because knowing this is the series finale, maybe they will just kind of really focus it on the Bad Batch and Omega, right? Like we have all these other kids and clones that need to be rescued. Maybe it really will come down to them, you know, like like plan 100, the last plan that they're all doing together mm-hmm. as this group in this time period. It's so sad. It's, re- it's really freaking sad. <laughs> I don't want to think about it. Yeah. But also, I'm, I am very much looking for, forward to the finale. Yeah. Star Wars does amazing finales, and I can't yeah. wait. And The Bad Batch has done pretty incredible finales as well. Absolutely. So. Animation finales are just next level. So yeah. I feel like I'm coming prepared with tissues and a big glass of water, <laughs> and it's going to be Gotta a time. You know what I mean? Going to be really hydrated. Like, the tears are going to flow, but I'll, I'm rehydrating. You know what I mean? Yeah. I I am I'm very excited. I can't I can't wait. I'm very excited too. It's it's going to be a good time. It, it's going to be a time. <laughs> it's going to be good though. I this we'll talk about it more obviously in our finale recap and analysis, but this show has just been so so special and I can't believe this is our last episode before the series finale. I I'm kind of like I don't want to end the podcast recording because I know. And it's almost over. I know. I know. But then we're closer to the finale and that's exciting. But then we're closer to the finale and that's sad. Yeah, exactly. A paradox. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. I do think that is going to wrap up our discussion on episodes 12, 13, and 14 of the Bad Batch season three. It feels weird. I don't know. Tell us what you think is going to happen in the finale. Please, let's let's chat about it. You can find us on Twitter at SkyTalkersPod or our personal handles. Mine is at Caitlin Plesher. Charlotte's is at Clarity. We also have our website, SkyTalkers.com, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, email, all good places to find us. And if you have a couple minutes and would like to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, we would really appreciate it. You can also screenshot that you're listening to the show in real time and tag and post it. Tag us and post it on your social media platform of choice, and we would love to reshare it. It kind of works like word of mouth to help other people know that you're listening and enjoying Sky Talkers. And if you're interested in way, other ways to support us and how to get involved in our wonderful Discord community, you can check out our reward tiers on Patreon. Also, I want to say you can always just share to stories. It doesn't have to be like a screenshot. You can do whatever you want. But we really appreciate anything in terms of sharing and word of mouth and talking about the podcast Mm -hmm. so that other people can find the show. With that, I want to say a huge thank you to these patrons. Kylie, Lindsay, Forrest Jedi, Corey, Olivia, Simon, Triumphant Ewok, Jess, Ali, Ben, Emily, Sophia, Tadashi, Brooke, Kat, David, Gary, Pam, Jonah, Becky, Patty, Adam, Allison, Tim, Carol, Kara, Nina, Emma, and Jose. Thank you so much for supporting us. Yes, thank you guys so much. And until next time, may the force be with you. May the force be with you. (laughs) 